give some applause to our dual pianist. I don't think you've done uh, dual pianos often. I, obviously, you did a great job. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that our hope is built on the solid rock, the solid rock and foundation of Jesus Christ who came and died to give us life everlasting. We want to be there when that trumpet sounds. We want to be found in heaven with Jesus and with our Lord. Lord, we ask that you would bless our class today. Give us some new insights and bless us in the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It's saying to be clogged up this morning. Good morning. I have a little story I want to read to you to start with. Okay, this is part one of two part lessons. <coughs> okay, this lesson. This is uh, from Ann Graham Lotz's book. Just, just give me Jesus. And I like this little story, so I'm just going to read it because I think it uh, is easier to read and get the whole thing than just me trying to tell it to you. He was just a young boy living on the streets in the slums of London. But Jeffrey had heard that a fiery American evangelist named D.L. Moody would preach in the evening service of a church on the other side of the city, and he wanted to hear him. On the day of the meeting, Jeffrey set out to find the church. He dodged rumbling carriage wheels slipped through crowded streets, stole an apple from a cart, and narrowly escaped the vendor's hand. As the sun began to set, he looked up and saw his destination. <clears throat> the church was set regally on a hill, its stained glass windows reflecting the setting of the sun with a golden iridescent glow that looked like the very glory of heaven. He could hear hundreds of voices rising and falling with the thunderous swell of organ pipes in praise music. <clears throat> The sight and sound seemed to reach out and envelop his fiercely independent yet lonely little heart, awaking, awakening a longing that felt like homelessness. Jeffrey didn't, didn't hesitate. He bounded up the long, sweeping staircase that led to the massive wooden front door. Just as he was about to enter, a big hand descended out of nowhere, grabbed him by the shoulder, spun him around, and inquired sharply, Just where do you think you're going, laddie? Jeffrey responded stiffly but truthfully. I heard Dr. Moody was going to preach here tonight. I've walked all the way across London to hear him. The big doorman looked down on that little boy with uncombed hair, unwashed face, unclean clothes, and unshod feet. And then he stated emphatically, Not you! You're too dirty to go inside! <clears throat> the doorman folded his arms across his big chest, spread his thick legs, and stood squarely in front of the door, blocking the entrance. Jeffrey lifted his little chin, squared his shoulders, glared back at the doorkeeper, then stalked off the front steps. He was confident he, could find, confident he could find another way into the church, but as he walked around the building, he found that all the other doors solidly locked, and the windows were too high for him to even attempt an entry. He ended up back on the front steps, where he plopped down in weariness and discouragement. In spite of his street-cultivated roughness, tears began to trickle down his grimy cheeks. Suddenly, his attention was caught by a black carriage that pulled up to the foot of the steps. A very distinguished-looking gentleman in top coat and hat climbed out, brandishing a walking cane and began to briskly climb the stairs. When he reached Jeffrey's step, he glanced over and noticed the curious interest in the young boy's eyes and the tear stains on his cheeks. He stopped abruptly and inquired, What's wrong? For a moment, Jeffrey started, Jeffrey started to shrug and say nothing. But something in the man's demeanor caused Jeffrey to blurt out, I came to hear Dr. Moody preach, but he says, I'm too dirty to go inside. And he gestured toward the doorman. The big man looked down at the little boy and then extended his hand. Here, take my hand, the man offered. Jeffrey took a long, hard look at the man and let his eyes focus on the man's extended hand. Slowly, he lifted his grimy little hand and placed it in that of a stranger who clasped it tightly 
and invited Jeffrey to come with me. And Jeffrey did. <clears throat> hand in hand, they walked up the long, sweeping staircase. When they came to the huge door, the very same doorkeeper who had formerly forbidden the boy to enter now hastily opened the door wide. With the man still gripping his hand, Jeffrey walked through the open door and down the center aisle of the church, already filled with worshipers, until they came to the very first row. With every eye on them, the big man seated Jeffrey right there in front of the entire congregation. Then the big man walked up on up the steps to the platform and stood behind the pulpit and began to preach. The man was D.L. Moody. You know, the only reason Jeffrey was allowed into the church was because he has clasping the hand of D.L. Moody. His acceptance in the church was based solely upon his acquaintance. His identification, his relationship with the man. In our long journey of life, someday we're going to look up at heaven and we're going to hear songs of praise and we may not be invited in unless we have the hand of Jesus in getting into the scripture, getting into heaven. We have that hand out for us and thank God we do. You know, because Jesus found us in our hopeless and helpless estate and his hand at the cross is when he welcomed us into heaven right then. And someday we're going to hear that. And, uh, you know, when we think about our hand in God, all we can do is praise God because of the, of the fact that Jesus died, made heaven available to sinners would not be available otherwise. The other words, he was here, not only through the cross, but through his resurrection. So here we're going to follow up a little bit with this story. We've been looking at the whole crucifixion, so forth, story. But following the crucifixion, what would usually happen, the dead bodies were usually just thrown on the ground and left for the dogs or the vultures to eat. Or, if they were really fortunate, they would be thrown into a common grave and buried. Um, but in, our, in Jesus' case, in John 19, it says that Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, because Jesus was executed as a criminal and uh, a, an enemy of Rome, Joseph's request to Pilate was extremely, really bold for him to come up there because remember that he is a, a member of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> so what could happen for him to take the risk of, a, of getting Jesus' body? This man who had been, ex had been crucified as a criminal and who had been reviled and bloody and um, Joseph took the chance because here's what could have happened to Joseph. Think about this for a minute. He would have been, could have been excommunicated from the Sanhedrin. He would have been excommunicated from the temple. He could have uh, been criticized because of handling a dead body, so he was unclean. And everybody then would be uh, on him. And yet, it was astounding because, remember, nowhere in the information that we have before this time do we hear of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, during that whole trial, he was there. He and Nicodemus both were there at the trial. But they were too timid to stand up. They were too timid to say, I know him. He's, he's right. They're afraid of their opinions of others. And there have been times when uh, I have been afraid of the opinion of others to stand up for Christ. I don't know if that's happened to you, but it has happened to me. And when Jer Joseph went to Pilate, he made a, st a statement. I want to take this man's body and treat it properly and put it in. I have a, I have a tomb. Already, I've been cutting this tomb out for me, but I'm going to let him go in my tomb. And when he went to Pilate, with Pilate's permission, um, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, 
the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Remember that? Okay. Now, this is the interesting thing that uh, Anne says here. She says she thinks that God is, God's heart was deeply moved because of this man who, and these two men who were very careful, they came to the cross, and they're still hanging on the cross, uh, gently took him off the cross. And uh, even though they had been silent, maybe it was something they could do for him. Um, the question is, if they were silent, and they didn't uh, make any noise about following Christ or, or lead, seeing how God is working in their lives, is that the same way we act? Sometimes are we ashamed of Christ or want not willing to, to stack, stick up for him? Or um, Just let things go by that we shouldn't let go by. They're playing it safe. Um, they went to Pilate, requested the body. When they did, they were crossing the line between their saying, I'm going against all that the Sanhedrin and all the rulers of Israel had, had said. They're saying, we're going with this man. And that's really, you no. Know, at this, we really don't hear any more about him. Just this little glimpse of these two men. A uh, little more about Nicodemus than we had of Jer Joseph Arimathea. But kind of interesting that um, Grant Pilate all he did was check to see, is the man dead? Sent to the centurion, the centurion sent it back, and he had been doing this a long time. He says, yes, he's dead, and so the pilot granted him the permission without any argument. This was highly unusual, because the people on who were crucified were just thrown on the ground, and they're torn off the, the crosses, or put into a common grave, because as criminals. He released this, um, this body to these men, and he's hanging there limp. And now think about this as they come. Okay. Um, what's going on inside these guys? Look up at this mangled body, uh, broken, bleeding. What about their emotions? What kind of emotional things do you think they had? Were they um, the horror of it? Gratitude? That now they know that he really was this con the Son of God. How about repulsion? Were they repulsed by it? How about the love that Jesus had shown for them? Or how about the rage? Why was this innocent man hung on this cross? Um, what's the, what is the grief they could have known? And the greatest sense of loss that they had. If they were believers, there would have been a tremendous sense of loss and grief there. You know? And so wondered whether did they did they pray at that time, saying something like, "Jesus, we thought you were the redeemer of Israel. We thought you were the one who was God walking on earth, and, and never did a man speak like you, and never did a man act like you, never did a man love like you, or live like you, or die like you." on the cross. As our commitment, we want to give you our lives and our in service. Are those the kind of things they were thinking about? I don't know, maybe. Um, first they had to take the spikes out of his feet. Then they had to take the spikes out of his wrist and take that body and probably put it on the shoulder or picked it up somehow uh, because it says in uh, John 19, that they came with spices and strips of cloth to, write, to wrap the body. So maybe they just took him down and began to put some ointment in, on him and wrap the body up and then took him off. We don't know for sure. But he says in John, Matthew 27 that Joseph took the body and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of rock. Then he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Interesting thing. You ever think about this? Somewhere in the shadows were this group of women watching the whole thing. 
Now, who were these women? All the Marys. <laughs> All the Marys. There's three or four Marys there. Uh, you know, in Matthew 27, it says, Among them was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And then in Mark, it says, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and Joseph, and Salome. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, <laughs> they had been, they stayed there at the cross. The crowds have gone. The thing is finished. They're still there at the cross, hiding, maybe hiding in the shadows or just sitting there just weeping and, and griefing, and grieving. And these two men come up and they begin to take the body off and they start wrapping it. Now this is, and they recognize these guys. These are famous guys. These aren't guys that, you know, ordinary guys like you and me. These are famous people. And uh, everybody in the area knew who these guys were, if they were Jews, Jews at all. And you know that uh, interesting thing is that when Jesus, remember what happened when Jesus bowed his head and gave up his life? A big earthquake. Remember the earthquake? It came and split the rocks in two, uh, tore the veil, and they turned. And, uh, and they remember that the uh, centurion, when he saw all this, this is what he said in Matthew 27, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. What about Mary, his mother? Did she raise her hands to her face and weep? Was she thinking back to the birth, miraculous birth? Was this truly the Son of God? What does this all mean? It, can it end here? Is this what it's all about? These are kind of questions that might have gone through her mind. Uh, but think about this, and I like what uh, Anne said here. She said, Deep down in the farthest recesses of her spirit, was there a stirring, an impression, a thought, a whisper, a still small voice reassuring her, this isn't the end. This isn't the end, Mary. It's just the beginning. Mary, this is Friday. Just you wait. Sunday's coming. Did you ever read that book by Howard Hendricks? Friday, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Uh, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. Now, they're waiting for a long time, and finally they see these guys, and they come up, and they see him taking the body off, and it was speak, and they took the body and laid it in the tomb, and then they, it was preparation day, so they couldn't do anything then. They had to go wait till after the Sabbath, okay? So in uh, Luke 23, it says, it was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. So, noti noticing that probably they didn't do too good a job of wrapping him up, they managed to get a few of the spices that, that they would put on the bodies and more wrappings. And uh, because in, in Luke 23, it says, when they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, they went back to where they were living. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Tore themselves away, hurried back, but they knew where he was buried because they followed Joseph to his tomb. Okay. Now here's, here's a, another scene. What about these religious leaders who had all this done? Anne seems to think that they didn't sleep very well that night. Very restless, and the reason that, for that is they had a nagging, a, nagging, a nagging thought, maybe a premonition, or maybe they remembered something that Jesus, they weren't finished with him, maybe. And so what'd they do? In Mark 15, they went to see Pilate first thing in the morning. And so, first thing Saturday morning, what were they? They showed up on Pilate's doorstep. Because it's doubtful that Pilate himself very slept very well either <laughs> because of this. Uh, because he was willing to listen to the request. Because here in Matthew 27, verses 62 <coughs> through 64, it says... Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, and they said, Sir, 
We remember that when he was still alive, that old deceiver, he said, after three days, I'm going to rise again. Oh, now if that happens, therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead, and that last deception will be worse than the first. Well, did Pilate's heart skip a beat when he heard he might rise from the dead? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know uh, this hot, like, experience of all things is just kind of, is it, is it making sense to Pilate? Something's going on? So quickly and almost urgently, before it became too late, Pilate said, okay, in Matthew 27, 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go and make it as secure as you know how. Okay, so here they go. They almost must have tumbled over each other to, run, to get the guard, you know. Yes, let's go, let's hurry. So they got four soldiers, and they put them, form a guard, so four soldiers, and put them at the tomb to guard uh, that tomb. With strict orders, keep watch 24 hours a day. And then in this, the tomb had the rock pulled in, but they, they sealed a rope around it with clay against the rope and a rope on the other side. So if you moved that thing, the clay would, clack, the clay would crack. And so they knew what something was going on with it, okay? Uh, so that, then they're, they're there 24 hours a day. Um, then they go off on their way, pretty sure that they've solved the problem. I think they've solved the problem. Well, even though the visible enemies of Jesus went to extra, extra lengths to prevent the rumor of his resurrection, what do you think was going on in the world of the invisible? Hmm? What do you think? After all, Satan had been trying to stamp out the Son of God since the beginning of the human race. Let's go back and take a little history look at lesson here. Okay, Think about it. After Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden... God pronounced judgment on them, but also he pronounced judgment on Satan. Okay? Uh, he said that in time, there would come a seed of the woman who would crush Satan's head. Remember that? In Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall braise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. Now, since that prophecy, Satan had been watching the sons of men with a high of a, an eye of a hawk. He wants to make sure that he cannot come up with the seed. With the seed. So, here's kind of a quick history lesson through there. In the next generation, he orchestrated events by sowing discord and jealousy until one of Eve's sons murdered the other one. Seth, Satan was after the seed, but he missed. Abel wasn't the one. In, verse, uh, in Genesis 4, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Did you ever think about that? Sin is crouching at your door, and it's trying to grab you, but you can take care of it. Okay. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So then Satan thought he was done with the seed. <laughs> Not quite. So what he did next was he supernaturally minged his own seed with that of the daughters of men until an evil race of beings provoked God's judgment. Almost eradicating the entire human race, Satan was after the seed, but again he missed. Instead, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and the human race was preserved. Remember in Genesis 6, it says, Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives from themselves, for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. 
Those were the mighty men who were of mold, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I have created, whom I have created from the f face of the island, if, sorry, from man to animals, to creeping things, to birds in the sky. I'm sorry I've made them all, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So we had the seed continue. Okay. Satan tried to get rid of the seed. And within ten, a few generations, here's what he had done. Satan mesmerized the human race through the charismatic leadership of Nimrod. Nimrod, who led the whole world in rebellion against God at the Tower of Babel. Once again, God's judgment was provoked. But this time, instead of sending a flood, God directly scattered, effectively scattered the human race all over the globe so it couldn't continue in rebellion to him. So then, God singled out one man. One man called Abraham to live a life of faith. Okay. And Abraham obeyed. If Abraham obeyed, God promised that he would send a seed through Abraham's family through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. In Genesis 12, this is what the Lord said to Abraham. Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham's seed. Okay. Now in, Gen in Galatians we hear this, this in Galatians 3. Now the promises that were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, doesn't he say, and to seeds, referring to many rather than one? And your seed, that is Christ. Okay. This is Paul pointing this out to the, to the Jews. Well, as soon as that happened, what did Satan try to do? He began to focus in his uh, efforts on the seed of Abraham's family. What did he do to them? He sent Ishmael against Isaac. He sent Isaac against Jacob. The eleven brothers against Joseph. Pharaoh against all the children of Israel until they were enslaved and put in a position until all their male children were to be murdered. Still after the seed. Satan was after that seed, but he missed. The sec next thing he did was God delivered up a, f a deliverer from Pharaoh's own household named Moses. And he was used of God to set him free, but Satan is a persistent devil. He attacked God's children through other nations, through idolatry, until they ended up in captivity in Assyria and Babylon. And once again, Satan hatched another wicked scheme to massacre the entire nation of Israel. What did he do? Remember that? He's after the seed. He missed again because Queen Esther stood in the gap. For a time, her beauty and her bravery were used for such a time, and God's people effectively defended themselves. And think about that, even as recently as Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, a rumor that a king was to be born among them. What happened? Satan moved to have Herod kill all the male children around Bethlehem, two years old and younger, in a sweeping ethnic cl cleansing that would surely take care of this little king. Surely we'll take care of the seed. And Satan was after the seed, but he missed again. And so the struggle continued. And we'll continue that next time. Okay, so let's, let's um, think about through for that, that seed. And when you think about Jesus on the cross, we think of the, of the sadness of that. But it was the, it was the, promise of God all through the generations from Adam and Eve if you, if you go back and just look through the scriptures you see that Satan this has been a spiritual battle all along spiritual battle all along and you and I are in a spiritual warfare and we need to remember that and we need to remember that we we belong to Jesus and that and he is the victor right he's the victor he we through him we have victory 
And so we really need to turn our eyes to him and, and pray to him and have his, his guidance in our lives. And so I want us to sing today page six. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I didn't plan on that one, but that's all right. All right, let's stand. Let's see. We'll do it through twice, okay? visible battle that we are going on. We need to keep looking at him. Let's do it one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for this wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow straight. pray. Father, as we think back through the ages, back even to the beginning, this invisible warfare with Satan trying to eradicate the seed has done a pretty good job through the years, and yet that seed was continued on even to the fact that Jesus is there, and he's on that cross on purpose, and Satan thought he would win the battle. But God, we know that you are the victor. And so we trust you. We trust you to help us to live our lives and be alert always to the spiritual battle going on. So we trust you, Jesus. We look to you. We praise you. We thank you for your, um, your crucifixion, for your willingness to stand on, stand for what God of truth and faithfulness. Help us to do that, Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name now. Amen. Amen.